Thank you, Andy. That was an amazing introduction. I had no idea you were going to play a video, let alone such an amazing video. Uh, for context about the crystals, I was saying I'm at my parents' house and my mum's into crystals and I was showing Andy a singing bowl just before everyone joined. So uh, yeah, I'm really excited that we're kicking off another Desai Guild. Um, we've got some amazing guests. So the format of it this time is we've just organized a few sort of like informal chats more than anything with a few very special guests each time. And each meeting has a different topic. And uh, the way we've broken it down is this is meta science or like the science machine, um, something along those lines. The next one is biotech, which is a little bit more self-explanatory. And then the following one, I think, Andy, you might have come up with this amazing name of like open intelligence, which is meant to be around like, um, decentralized AI, compute, and uh, data as well. So anyway, so uh, without further ado, what I'm going to do is introduce each of our guests. And then the format is they've each got about five minutes to explain their work. And then we'll have sort of an open discussion from the floor around any questions which you guys have, because ultimately this is a space for you all to just have those kernel-like conversations. So we've got Shadi, Carla, and Patrick. So Shadi Aldamati is a neuroscientist working in the field of cognitive development. He's an advocate for open science practice and founder of OPSI to help push this mission along. Carla Osman is a psychologist and open science enthusiast. She believes that all scientific knowledge is of knowledge should be accessible to everybody, both from an ideological and practical perspective. She believes limiting access to knowledge also limits humanity's chance of overcoming the challenges we're facing today. So at DSI Lab, she's working on creating a new system for scientific publishing that values openness and robustness and novelty. And last but not least, we have Patrick Joyce. So Patrick, uh, now I just want to um, say these are his words, not mine. Patrick is a PhD program and medical school dropout who is the co-founder and COO of Research Hub, a scientific forum that rewards anyone for openly publishing, discussing and reviewing academic research. So thank you so much, guys, for joining today. Um, I'm really grateful to have you here and I'm sure everyone else on the call can't wait to hear from you. So maybe first of all, should we kick off? We'll just do the same order as that. So maybe Shadi, if you go first, give about in five minute intro to your work. Um, I won't cut you off at five minutes, but I'll just warn you just in terms of timekeeping. So yeah, over to you. It sounds good. Yeah, and I'm starting right at the, the 10 minute mark so I can uh, keep, keep an eye on the clock there. Hi everybody, uh, thanks for joining us in this space. And thank you, Andy, for kind of curating uh, an awesome kind of environment to, and with some really interesting kind of quotes to kind of help facilitate our thoughts and, and discussions and, and hopefully find some convergence points. So where do I start? Uh, yeah, maybe I'll just kind of tell you all a little bit about how I ended up in this space um, and then kind of what my hopes and aspirations are for the pursuit of discovery and knowledge in general, and maybe some kind of tangible immediate steps that uh, I'm taking along with others to make that a little bit more achievable in the near future. So yeah, uh, as Sarah mentioned, uh, I'm a neuroscientist. I still identify primarily as one, still working on papers and submitting papers and doing that whole shindig. I got my PhD in 2020 after kind of a bit of a long <laughs> drawn out uh, longitudinal adolescent brain development study where I followed teenagers from ages 11 to 12 all the way into young adulthood, imaging their brains at regular time points along the way and producing algorithms that allowed us to estimate things like what their biological or cognitive age is relative to perhaps their chronological age and looking at how things in the environments um, or how biological mediating factors might perhaps push them along a different developmental trajectory. So as you know, as you know, that this kind of work is going to be limited by where you are in the world and who which children you're studying and what culture surrounds them and what practices surround them. So, you know, really kind of key to this, this work and, and something that I really set out as an ambitious goal was not to, um, not to publish any kind of resolute facts about how, how like a mature person looks like without extrapolating out to other populations and other cultures. And this was really hard, right? Not only, you know, because you have to collect the data, you have to you know, have these cultural bridges. And some of that work was was made really easy for us, right? Because there's there were other groups around the world that were doing really similar research, either directly in collaboration through our funders, or just, you know, it's it's uh, a really current topic trend that's occurring right now today. And, you know, one of our key kind of challenges was how do we actually aggregate our data together, even if we were using the same protocols and the same 
kind of experimental controls in, in most cases, there's a, there's, an, there's a difficult, there's an incredible difficulty in the infrastructure that we all rely on to be able to throw our data, you know, and I'm talking about hundreds of terabytes of data in one shared cloud instance or, you know, one university and being able to run interoperable algorithms with the same sets of pre-compiled libraries and binary files and software applications that give us the same results. And so we saw this, right? Like we saw people that were running the result, um, the same data on different machines and in different institutions and getting completely drastic different results, drastically different results. And, and that was that was holding us back. And you know, this was kind of coupled by the fact that GDPR had certain regulations that were present in the EU. Uh, Australia was dealing with kind of their own regulations. The US is pretty much chaotic and uh, tons in various spot from institution to institution. So you know, this this became kind of, you know, I became an impromptu data engineer and having to try to solve this problem so I could accomplish my research. And what I ended up doing uh, was figuring out actually that I can't solve this on my own, uh, although I tried my darndest to with, with the resources that were available to me and brought this to a global brain hack community uh, in 2020. And there we uh, basically put out this idea for baby steps towards decentralized science or DSI. Uh, where we were looking to see, could we build a shared data fabric across these different institutions to be able to all collaborate? Uh, and we were using IPFS as kind of the substrate for that. So we were successful with that. We uh, integrated IPFS support into uh, this distributed data archive, our archival tool that's used by scientists everywhere. And that kind of helped us really kind of link these different objects together. Although, you know, what we realized is, okay, we built it, but it didn't necessarily mean people were going to use it. So we, you know, dove a little bit deeper into it. And then that's kind of when we fell into the Web3 rabbit hole, when we realized what we were looking at is a coordination problem for scientists. Now today, um, really kind of uh, focused on building a, an on-chain society or community of Web3 scientists that are uh, basically all unified around open scientists and specific methodologies to, 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 to realize that. And so specifically what we do is we look at, um, we look at uh, basically data set publishing as a way of embodying open science practice. So you can choose to publish your data in many ways, but it's often very difficult to, um, you know, decide on one form or the other. So we've embraced community standards that have emerged th throughout the neuroimaging community. And what we do is we incentivize individuals to publish data sets reproducibly following the standard by maintaining basically NFTs or impact certificates, also known as hyper certificates, that allow us to retroactively fund those researchers that put in the time and the energy and, and, and so forth to, to make that happen. So I think I'm at time here and I could definitely keep talking about this, but uh, I'll stop there and we'll see where the conversation goes. Thank you, Shadi. That was amazing. Um, okay, so maybe we'll go next with Carla. And in the meantime, what might be the best way of doing this is if people put questions in the chat. Uh, otherwise, maybe you'll all just rush to ask questions. I don't know. We'll see what happens. But if you have questions, maybe put them in the chat. That sounds sensible. So Carla, maybe do you want to go next, please? Thank you, Shadi. Yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, first of all, welcome, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm super excited about this conversation. Um, so yeah, I work uh, for DSI Labs. We're building a decentralized scientific publishing layer. And I guess the way I got into it, so I'm a psychologist by training. And I like the first thing they teach you about metascience is that, oh, psychology has a serious reproducibility crisis and a replication crisis. Like there's crazy numbers out there where it's debatable like which are true but there's numbers like 90 percent of the findings in the field are not true they could be replicated and i don't know you like start studying this and you're like wait all this is false uh, why am i doing this so then that kind of got me interested in okay how can we make science more true how can we make it more robust and how can we build an infrastructure and a ecosystem in which it makes sense to do that and you're not pushed and incentivized to publish false results just because it will advance your career because that's currently more the environment that um, I'm seeing as this whole publisher parish culture and yeah alongside with that um, as I was doing my research for my thesis I realized that even though my university is paying millions in subscriptions to journals I don't even I don't have access to all the papers right and then it's it's kind of a crazy thought when you think about how as somebody who's just a taxpayer, normal taxpayer, not university affiliated, you basically fund a lot of the research with your tax money because a lot of basic research is governmentally funded. And 
then that research gets produced, it gets published, and you can't read it. And then you have to pay 40 bucks or like up to 100 bucks per article, which is also crazy. Um, and then there's open access um, publishing models where then the author pays like thousands of dollars to publish. And it's all so, yeah, I just realized like, I don't know, all of this sucks. And I feel like we need a better solution. And yeah, all of these problems kind of motivated me to go into the place, uh, into the space of DSI. And so what we do at DSI Lab is just try to solve both these problems, so openness and reproducibility, where we're trying to build infrastructure on which you can publish openly on a peer-to-peer -peer -peer network. So we're using IPFS as well, uh, which is open access by default. It's very like, trustworthy or like it's trustless basically because you can't really change the data without changing it won't go into details but so it's more it's more of a, a decentralized and trustworthy solution and um at the same time we're trying to design the publication flow in a way that adheres very strongly to the fair data principle so meaning that data that gets published is findable accessible interoperable and reusable um meaning that you have to um, add a lot of rich metadata, you have the ability to connect um, your different research artifacts from your manuscript and your code and your data connected in a way that makes it very easy for the reader to then basically end-to-end -end reproduce all of your calculations, which is not necessarily a proof that all of it was true, but at least your calculations are not and your data kind of gets you to the results. Um, so yeah, that's what we're building. That's why I got into it. I think I'll stop there for now. Thank you, Carla. That was really um, fascinating. Thank you. Great. Okay. And now, Patrick, last but not least, do you want to go next, please? Yeah, definitely. And thanks for organizing this, Sarah. Yeah. So, my name is Patrick. Um, I'm one of the co founders of Research Hub. A little bit about my background. Um, after college, I was really lucky, got to work in a tumor biology lab at Johns Hopkins, looking at the epigenetics of cancer stem cells. It was an HHMI funded lab with a bunch of like brilliant people. I fell in love with academic science, doing bench work started a PhD in molecular biology uh, in Boston at BU and uh, quickly found that not all environments in academic science are the same as HHMI funded labs. Uh, I worked for a professor um, in synthetic biology who had like multiple nature papers, an early career researcher who, while I was rotating through his lab, um, essentially was applying for his next grant and spent like six months walking around on eggshells because if he didn't get the funding, he was going to have to leave BU, pretty much uproot his family, go to a new university. And to me, I was like blown away by how someone who basically had as much success as is possible for an early career researcher still had like almost zero job security and was dependent on kind of like the granting decision of 20 people in a room where he had no real influence on the actual process. So I saw like a lot of crazy stories in my PhD program, just another one, which was like pretty shocking. Um, there was a ninth year PhD student in a molecular biology lab uh, who was basically paying for their own experiments, living on a friend's couch in order to try and get a PhD to make like 45K as a postdoc somewhere. And so it was like a brilliant person who worked really hard, who for the first like three years of their PhD was giving or given a project um, that was proved to not be able to be replicated like three or four years later. So they were basically given like an impossible task and they weren't able to do it. And then they had to like pay their own money in order to like produce enough data to eventually have a PhD, which just felt like crazy to me. So um, I ended up leaving with the master's, uh, started medical school in DC. Um, I like love medicine, specifically mental health, psychiatry. But once I had gotten to the clinic, it was just like astounding to me how most of the frontline like medications and therapies are from like, like 50 years ago, and there hasn't been a whole lot of innovation. Um, and they don't really even work that well. And they're not targeted like towards patients where they could work well. And so to me, it felt like very frustrating to potentially like contribute to this industry of like stagnation kind of when there are a lot of people who like actually need like, you know, medical help when it comes to their own mental health. And so um, being frustrated with the whole system, I kind of thought like a lot of the issues are due to this like kind of antiquated system for funding and publishing science. Like we're all familiar with like open access and how like government funded research ends up behind paywalls a lot of the time. Um, but it's even like in the States, I'm not sure if it's like this all around the world, 
but it's something like 1% of first year PhD students end up becoming research professors. So there's this like incredibly competitive job market for like just like staying in academia. And it creates this incentive structure um, all based on citations where researchers, you almost have to kind of tailor your research outputs to maximize citations just to have a career. And it's like a, a bad system, kind of like Carla said, because it incentivizes people to like maybe overstate their findings or p hack or, you know, like you you have to do these things just to have a chance at survival. And so um, basically recognizing some of these issues, I took a year off from medical school and um, wanted to build like a, a Reddit for science where you could maybe try and compete with citations as a metric for academic success. Um, using like a token reward that is malleable and can change over time. And so I built like an MVP, um, ended up uh, getting in touch with um, the founder of Coinbase. We decided to co-found Research Hub together. Been working on it for about like two and a half years now. Have like a nice early community, but still very pre-product market fit. And we're currently iterating, trying to find like token-based features that can provide value to scientists to get that like kind of organic growth that we're hoping for. So yeah, it's kind of like a big picture um, where I'm coming from, what we're hoping to accomplish with Research Hub. And I think the end goal is to create like a, a reward, you know, structure that helps to encourage um, healthy research behaviors. So that's the plan for Research Hub is over time to like build a community that's trying to think about how you can reward research outputs in a way that like creates a healthier, more collaborative and productive like funding and publishing environment for science. Thank you very much, Patrick. That was that was amazing. Um, thank you, the three of you, for some very inspiring, very quick talks. Um, it's interesting to hear. It's almost like you've all just amalgamated this um, rather horrible dossier of how broken science is, I have to say, and I think I, I agree with, with everything that was pretty much said. Um, I think, Shadi, you're talking about like the problems with data sharing and collaboration, and, and Carla, yours is about, you know, the publishing costs and the reproducibility, and Patrick as well, what you're talking about, you know, the, the job security and the incentives and like how that leads to like p-hacking and things like that. It's quite a damning dossier is what, um, what I mean for like the science machine or meta science or whatever we're going to call this. Um, so thank you for your sort of insights and, and sharing more about what you're doing to, I guess, improve the situation. Um, so there's just been a little bit of, of conversation in the chat. So Armin, you gave some interesting ideas around, well, some interesting comments around psychology and, um, you know, psych publishing infrastructure to, for psychology. Did you maybe want to want to ask a bit about that? You don't have to. Yeah. No, no, no. Like, uh, so as, as something what Patrick mentioned, like the existing uh, way we have like designer incentives within the like within the academia is one of the reasons why some existing researchers are like uh, blasphemous in a way. And uh, I believe that in order to like set up the like set up the infrastructure, like one of the one of the basics that like one of the basics from what I got from like Patrick's like uh what from what Patrick said is like we need to work on our incentives. So what what the other thing that I wanted to ask is like what are some other things within the publishing infrastructure within the academia that we need to like revolutionize like we think according to like all, all of you. So so I can start first. That's okay. Um I think like thinking back to where these incentives came from, right? They're kind of like grandfathered in, like the way that science works is there's a wealthy patron who has some money and like they want to, you know, help support science. So scientists apply and then the wealthy patron gives their money out to whoever they think, you know, can do the best job of producing knowledge. So like I think it is important to empathize with the wealthy patron patron. Like how do you decide? You know, you get like say 100 grant applications for like uh, RFP, how, how do you decide who's the most likely to give you the best like return on investment for lack of a better term of your grant funding? It's a hard question. <laughs> like I don't have the answer. I, I think like we use citations now because it's like, it's a low hanging fruit proxy metric. You know, that's like, it makes sense, right? Like if a lot of like, your colleagues like think your work is valuable and they want to build upon it, like you're probably like, you know, putting good stuff out there. Um, but I always like 
uh, think of it kind of like the the click based advertising model where you know before like New York Times like had to like you know get people to pay subscriptions and that's a little bit different than like getting people to click on your website so it's kind of like almost like the BuzzFeed effect you know like a like an aggressive analogy there but like yeah the incentives for scientists aren't right and it's because it's really hard for funders to determine like who's the best person to give my money to and so I don't have like a, a good solution here but like a, a more objective and accurate way to determine like what value a scientist has produced in the past and like how likely are they to produce that value in the future um yeah, so this is like probably like a bad analogy, but like one thing I always think about too is when you use citations as your metric of like potential future success, um, you pretty much exclude all early career researchers because like you have to have a couple publications, you know, in order to like have those like citation metrics, right? And so like when you look at like like sports, for instance, like there's a lot of value in potential you know, like, like a up and coming athlete, you know, like they're worth a lot more than someone who's like already at the top of their career, maybe their performance is better, but the potential isn't there. And so like thinking about how we can like, communicate to funders, like, accurately, who's the best person to give my money to, I, I don't know how to do it. But I think that's the next thing that needs to be fixed in order to help get good incentives out there that cause healthy behaviors and a little bit more of like a collaborative environment for science. Yeah, if, if I can jump in there, I think one of the really kind of key uh, issues that was identified and attempted to be tackled by some of the open science practitioners, right? So putting open science in uh, a productive way, like in an actual building out infrastructure and software to facilitate open science. And these were the folks over at ORCID. And, you know, what they immediately realized as kind of a key issue was that research evaluation relied on metrics that, like you mentioned, Patrick, are often kind of either nonsensical, right? You either have this chicken and egg problem with uh, citations or that perhaps are too coarse or too low resolution to actually tell you whether that piece of knowledge that they're accumulating has had actual knock-on effects in other labs or in other uh, applied use cases. So, you know, with ORCID, their kind of attempt there, and ORCID, if you guys aren't aware, is uh, kind of like this universal persistent identifier for scientists. It gives you kind of like this long number, and that number is attached to your journal login to um, maybe like your other digital presence and, and, uh, and other academic web services. And it allows you to kind of link these through OAuth and single sign-on, uh, link kind of events that are happening in different ecosystems to this universal record. And you can track things like peer reviews, published data, other types of academic activity that's often not tracked. So you can kind of see how they're floating or flirting with some of these Web3 principles that, you know, we tend to think were invented for the first time in Web3, but uh, that people have been kind of building and thinking these uh, along these ideas for a while. And, you know, I think the key issue there is that they were trying to tackle is, all right, well, if we can give a much richer set of axes or just more axes of comparison and evaluation for funders from different programs, whether it's biology or NIH common, uh, you know, uh, common fund, which is perhaps higher, higher risk research funding, as opposed to NIMH, which is, you know, tried and true research programs that are issued by a national mandate uh, or guided by national mandate. So, you know, I think kind of bringing this conversation back to how do we think about the kind of metrics and axes that science and practice of science can 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 uh, can rely upon or can leverage to signal uh, success and facilitate success. So some key examples I think are worth pointing out are identifying practices that themselves lead to demonstrable or verifiable knock-on effects. So for example, replication of a research study. I think this is kind of the killer feature or proof of replication is one of the killer um, use cases for Web3 that you can't just implement in Web2, right? Because, I mean, you could probably find some way to do it, but in Web3, you have this perhaps cryptographic mechanism for taking a data set and its contents and hashing it using cryptography, but Web3 and cryptography in general, uh, and, and perhaps generating a content-based identifier of how that data set was produced or 
that result was produced from a certain data type with a certain type of content with these, you know, decentralized identities that were uh, perhaps have this history of contribution. So, so that's one example, right? Proof, proof of replication and using cryptography along with kind of providence and tracking to, to track these metrics over time. And that can't be the only one. I think there are other ones out there too. Yeah, that was, that's an interesting point. Um, I kind of want to jump in here on the point of proof of replication because I love the idea. I'm skeptical of it because so replication and reprodu reproducing science, that's two different things. So reproducing is you take the same data and the same code and you get to the same results. And then replication is you do the same study, collect new data, and then you get the same results. And so the latter is a better proof of actually this knowledge being true, this finding really existing in real life. And like the thing with reproducibility, like you can easily implement this proof of reproduction, I guess. Um, but you never really know is the data set that was published in the first time, was that manipulated? Like that one's very hard to track. And maybe Shadi, you have an idea of like how to do that. Maybe I just don't know. I just want to create a space for anyone else to jump in. Uh, yeah, just I, I think it's it's definitely I think um, yeah. <laughs> so you know, in in my field, um, there is a challenge in just getting the same result with different software because people are writing uh, either running software in different environments, and these are pre-compiled libraries or you know binary files that might use different like rounding mechanisms. And it's all very, very specific. We're not as good, at least in neuroscience, as we are in physics and getting that like, you know, six sigma or seven sigma precision in, in, this, in, in uh, this physical significance of the, of the result, right? So I think there are definitely hierarchies for replication. There's really kind of low hanging fruit, which is, hey guys, can we clean up shop and make sure that we're all using the same tools that when we hammer a nail in, that we're hammering, hammering it in at the right angle, you know, and we're able to do this over and over and over again as a community. And I think kind of, you know, building up and climbing up that ladder and getting to the point where we're actually validating with different data sets and demonstrating that, you know, maybe it's not the same exact result, but there's enough nuance there to allow for a new research direction to open, right? Perhaps the distinct, distinction between, you know, from maybe my expertise, the metaphor, uh, or from my background, a metaphor, uh, how perhaps adolescent brains are developing in DC versus how they might be developing in, in Southern uh, Brazil, for example. And so some things might be right, some things might not. And that's, I think, part of the excitement is uh, maybe we should get excited when things don't fully uh, validate or fully reproduce or replicate, I guess, I think as Lays used it. And but you know, at the very least, we should make sure that our tools are not betraying us and betraying kind of the assumptions that we have. Thank you, thank you all, and thank you for that question, Armand, that um, generated all that. We've had some interesting discussions in the chat. I won't go into all of them, but there was just a really good. Um, I love this one by Robin there. Maybe this will be a good next one, unless anyone obviously wants to jump in. Um, how does the academic community um, generally feel about DSI? Is it a controversial topic? So yeah, I'd love to hear um, the opinion from you three about how you've experienced talking to your peers about this or, you know, um, yeah, just, just uh, so maybe, I don't know who wants to go first on that one, just jump in if you do. Yeah, maybe I can jump in here because I'm currently, so we're in a uh, closed alpha phase and we're currently, running a lot of user tests on our infrastructure so i'm running these and get to see their reactions face to face and it's always interesting because um so the general principles of openness you know having a sense of verifiability um and then uh, all the other stuff that we're building too there it's usually like the general principles get a lot of agreement from the scientific community then when it gets to the point of like publish and sign in with your wallet is like ooh. like I get a lot of these like initial really like nah, very very careful reactions of um, skepticism around what firstly there's a lack of knowledge like what is a wallet what does it mean and then secondly I got a lot of comments like I feel like I get scammed right now and that's a very important learning for us and we still haven't figured out how to navigate that part because I think yeah, in general, like the principles, again, I think align very closely with what most scientists feel anyways. I, I feel like the general web 
free um, scheme. Yeah, not, not generally per perceived as very trustworthy. So yeah, we're trying to get away, for example, from like web free branding because it doesn't help, it just doesn't help. Yeah, so for Research Hub, I kind of think of like uh, academia into two separate groups. There's like people who have um, succeeded in the current system and are like at the top of the academic hier or hierarchy. And they're like, you know, on those granting committees, like they have tenure. Um, they're not quite as like worried about their future career. And um, those people tend to be pretty skeptical which is reasonable, right? If you're trying to build like a new like reputation system and slightly like disempower their position, like I, you know, it's the only natural human reaction to have that. Um, and then there's like early career researchers who um, are disenfranchised by the current system. And they're like, like we have may maybe like five to 10 psychology PhDs who like kind of see that they're not going to be able to get a professorship and they're looking for like UX research positions, but like they don't really want to do UX research, you know, they want to do psychology research. And so like they see Research Hub kind of as like an opportunity to maybe have like a part-time job doing the science that they actually want to do while they're paying like their rent and their food bills, you know, with their UX research job. So yeah, I think like people who are in need of like uh, sustainable funding are open to any way to get that sustainable funding. And people who are like not necessarily as like um, desperate's the wrong word, but like pe people who have resources, they're not necessarily thinking about how to improve the system. And so, yeah, I think um, just as one example, there's a, a quantum biologist out of UCLA where this is like looking at like the quantum physics of like how photosynthesis works. It's an interesting situation. They have like 20 different people or PIs at UCLA um, who had some initial funding but have lost it. And they can't get funding from the NIH NSF because it's too new of a field. And so they're actually going to Gitcoin grants to try and like raise money via Gitcoin. So, you know, these are like top of the line researchers who like are at the top of their young field. And because they don't have like the funding of like an established professor, they're open to like DSI and Web3 and like try, you know, we'll, we'll jump through whatever hoops they need to in order to like continue working on, you know, what they're passionate about. So, yeah, I think the tough part is going to be convincing established scientists, but um, like disenfranchised early career researchers are open to whatever, you know, they can get in order to try and like continue to do science. Yeah, absolutely, Patrick. Oh, I was just gonna say, thank you, Patrick. That sounds amazing. Can you actually drop a link in? Someone's been asking for it and I wanna have a look at that grant as well. Sorry, Shidi, go ahead. Your turn now. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I thought I had a bit of a lag here, but yeah, no, I just wanted to, to kind of jump in because I think that Patrick is really honing in on, what web3 has to offer and it might not be what we think right right it's not you know we have these you know grand ideas of tokenization and thinking of open source finance tools and um, this, you know revolutionizing how we think about societies and, and web native communities and virtual spaces but you know at the heart of web3 isn't really kind of this technological superiority. In a lot of cases, it is inferior. And the reason I say this is I think to the last kind of interview that I had with, with a scientist that was trying to use some of these tools that we built, which is, hmm, it's not performant. It's, it just doesn't work the way that I need it right now. Uh, he used the word performant in the sense that, you know, I have this one exabyte image that I've collected uh, that basically you could think of it as a Google map of uh, the species that I'm studying. And right now, if I wanted to upload it and use it on your system, it won't, it wouldn't work, right? And it wouldn't work probably in most cases, even I think if Protocol Labs facilitated uh, a lot of these, uh, and, and you know, they are kind of facilitating a lot of this architecture that we're, that we're building on. So, you know, he can go to Amazon S3 and kind of use drag and drop sort of plug and play components to be able to service the needs that, that he has to be able to complete his grant to be able to work with his colleagues and all this good stuff so you know i think the key distinction really is that web3 has a really strong cultural like a nascent developing culture where a lot of wealth has been generated very quickly 
following from philosophical principles of self-sovereignty, of kind of uh, uplifting of the individual, of community coordination, um, of rethinking about the contracts that bind us as a society or as a collective, and considering how we can move forward together and reinvent new, new forms of coordination and collaboration. This really appeals to the incredible talent overflow that's been occurring over the past like two, two and a half decades in science, right? So there's ex exceptionally more new PhDs and highly trained inquisitive problem solvers being minted than there are faculty positions, right? I think the average age for receiving an R01 grant in the United States, which is this gold star mark of approval, you've made it as a scientist. You can now, you know, do the research of, of your dreams, right? Or the research that fits into institutional funding mandates um, that was, is likely to pass peer review for funding. And uh, that, that age is, you know, border, is getting closer to 50. Uh, and it keeps going up higher and higher and higher. And more and more PhDs are being trained. And what you're seeing is a lot of them are going into consulting. A lot of them are taking really crappy gigs as, you know, adjunct professors teaching classes um, or going into industry and, and, and doing so. So you, and I think NSF and NIH do recognize this. And there are advocates on the inside that are willing to experiment and identify methods or new ways of, of, of kind of leveraging this highly trained workforce, um, this highly trained discovery force, right? Because uh, scientists are discoverers in a way. And I think, you know, it's up to us to really what we can offer as a community is to identify a shared vision of how sh science should work in these digital native spaces and to demonstrate that, right? To show that the things that most institutional um, academics or grant funders or program officers would write off as being too crazy to crowdsource scientific funding. You mean the people are gonna peer review their own grants? Ha 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 ha, that will never happen, right? You'll just get flat earthers. Um, so, so I think kind of demonstrating through use uh, that these philosophical principles can manifest into actionable next steps where we're actually doing real science. It's rigorous. It has knock-on effects. People are doing fellowships, getting educated, publishing, and competing just as well, if not better. But these entrenched scientists, that's how we take it to the next step. Thank you, Shadi. That was really interesting. I love this idea of digital native science. Like it's, it's just so important. Um, thank you all. So we've had a few interesting questions, but I see Richu, you've had your hand up for a little while. So do you want to take the floor next, please? Yeah. Um, so one question that I want to ask was, uh, how can we uh, tackle corruption within the scientific community? As in corruption, as in so, uh, I my undergrad degree was in nanotechnology, and I was uh, doing a little bit of research in it in India. And one of the things that I saw again and again is, uh, you know, PhD guides taking advantage of their kids, um, you know, three when they are in the third year and their final year, because at that point, the student has, uh, you know, invested two, three years um, under this uh, researcher, and then, you know, you're stuck with that person. So it's it's your entire life is in, in in the control of this person, and you can't really say anything. And it's 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 a it's a crazy, <laughs> cracky place. Like it's like you know, ask for sexual favors like outright. Um and um, research grants like you know, um, as a researcher, you get to choose which companies' devices are you buying. So you know, you 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 get to make all sorts of money through those choices and uh, uh, these. They, they might be very respected, like uh, there are, you know, researchers who are like French Royal Society members who in the background are not at all who they say they are. Um, and like, what can Web3 do in uh, enabling the people who are being um, sort of, uh, you know, the, 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 the people who are suffering, like how can we enable those people to speak out against these kind of people and 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 because science fundamentally is international um so you maybe uh, and all these papers are being internationally reviewed and all the sciences you know like they get grants from the west like be it europe be it us uh, so can we have systems where these things can come up more often than not uh, yeah that's Um, do any of our guests want to answer that or address some of the concerns raised there? Very interesting question. Yeah, so I think like specifically with having like a not great mentor, um, I know uh, biology always talks about like the cost to exit systems. So like 
right now, one of the issues is like, what's your alternative, right? Like you got to transfer to a new lab and then maybe add like another like two or three years to your PhD. Maybe there's an opportunity to have like, like uh, part-time science, you know, like maybe like you leave your PhD, go work for like an industry or whatever. And then like in your free time, you can do the science that you want, you know, getting paid online somehow. Um, that option doesn't currently exist today, but I think like building infrastructure to create more competition where your supervisor has to treat you with more respect or else you'll leave, I think is probably the way to align the incentives there. But yeah, a lot easier said than done. Right. Thank you, Patrick. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Carla, did you want to jump in there? Yeah, I wanted to try and say something on the topic. I don't feel 100% uh, I'm the person to provide a solution for that problem. But I think with a lot of these really deeply ingrained, toxic um, relationships in science, if I can say that, um, I think a system that is much more transparent will go a very, very long way where all the actions that we take as we're producing science are kind of transparently available to everybody and um, where it's just open and for everybody to see if there's a mentor who or a professor who's treating their PhD badly by how, whatever that may look like in that form but um, I think a general theme of more transparency and this relates to a lot of other um, practices in science can go a long way where people will be more um, respectful of each other and more constructive. Um, so yeah, that's just my two cents, I think. One, one, one of the um, thoughts that I have, it's not, it's not directly related to your question, Richard, but also just to double tap on something Richard said earlier, which is that like part of the rep rec reproducibility crisis also has to do specifically in psychology with the fact that everybody is weird <laughs> by which we mean western educated industrialized rich and democratic but also weird <laughs> uh, um, because we're among friends but the uh like, like one aspect that i think about in 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 this like realm of questions is that like when we like focus more on like the like the respect and like healthy cultures question uh it can like mix how we think about the protocols the technology and particularly like the medium right uh because like we want to like think very carefully about the medium in which we work and the messages that it allows for uh and and have that then shape like the uh the kind of pro-social outcomes that might arise as a result of well-engineered media and like an example of this because Carla mentioned IPFS earlier is like everybody looks at IPFS and the notion of CIDs and uh, you know content addressability and permanence and they're like okay that's what we should focus on in terms of the media but there's something like more interesting about it in some way right which is that like when we think about like archival in general and digital preservation there's actually like a whole bunch of people in the world, unsurprisingly, who care about this, mostly at academic institutions. Uh, and one of the interesting, they, they've put out a document about like the eight features of digital archives that are required for like high scale research and academic use. And one of the critical features of that is bit rot detection. So the ability to uh, ensure that the archive remains uh, wholesome over time and this is a very difficult computer science problem right like if you're scanning the whole archive all of the time it's very inefficient and you can't do it well nobody has come up with like a very good bit rot detection algorithm until ipfs right? until falcoin because one of the features of the network is that you constantly get challenged by random people in the network to prove that you have random bits of what you initially agreed to store and this peer-to-peer -peer network of challenges and proofs about what you on chain agreed to store is a wonderful approximation of a bit rot algorithm right and and that's kind of fascinating and more than that when i'm an academic institution who's having to pay an enormous amount of money for software licenses and for storage and I instead use something like Filecoin and that archive becomes culturally relevant there is the possibility that I will get paid 
<laughs> for storing the information and making it accessible to others rather than paying software licenses and other fees. So there you have like both an economic arguments, which suddenly might make people sit up because it's very difficult work to get through any academic com committee about anything, let's be honest, but particularly about using open source software that is experimental. Uh, but also this unique feature right, of the medium itself, like the drop detection in this particular case. And I wonder like, you know, as we think about DSI as well, clearly, you know, like one of the, the interesting other features of these media that we're talking about is that they are fundamentally economic. Uh, and, and like that's, you know, like Shadi has touched on it and Patrick has touched on it as well in terms of like, okay, like what are the, what are the ways in which we can leverage the inherent programmability of money to think about like healthy and sustainable funding mechanisms that, you know, like don't fall into these traps of we fund, you know, we give the most rewards to those which are like the content which is accessed the most because that often amplifies falsifiable results that are inflammatory and divisive. And don't just amplify those which have the most citations because that privileges late stage researchers, but use those along with a bunch of other things that are programmable. <laughs> to get us toward like increasingly healthy ways of recognizing truly valuable work and surfacing it. Yeah, so this is a really cool comment. I, I always think about this through the lens of like good arts law where, um, what's, a, what's the quote? It's like, when you have a measure and it becomes a target, um, like it's no longer useful as a measure anymore. So I think that happens with citations. And I think like, the issue that funders um, have is that any measure they want to use will eventually be like gamed by the people who are trying to help their career by optimizing. So I kind of think funders need to like consider good arts law and start to create behavioral targets, not necessarily thinking about like metrics, but saying, hey, we're going to fund people who do X and try and like use that financial incentive to cause healthy behaviors rather than thinking like, hey, I'm going to like use like, you know, I guess like uh, organic behaviors, measure them and then give money to whatever I think is the best. So so kind of like a, a framing of almost like bounties, you know, for like specific types of content rather than like using metrics to then and like fund people for the future. Thank you, Patrick. Yeah, yeah. Really interesting comments. Shadi, um, you had some comments going on the chat. I don't know if you wanted to expand a bit on that. There's some interesting chat going on there. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, just really quick in response to uh, to, to uh, uh, Patrick, um, it's good to see you, by the way, uh, that, yeah, these metrics, they kind of tend to, people always find ways to engineer some sort of you know, co-opting or, you know, adversarially kind of find some way around them, right? Uh, and some, a really great example of that is the amyloid beta 56. 56 is the size of this protein that was identified in 2006 as having some sort of correlation with specific symptoms related to Alzheimer's. So they thought that they saw dementia symptoms in mice. And so it was published in Nature, cited thousands of times. These, you know, the, the, the scientists behind the work they kind of were elevated to, to rock stardom, got tons of funding, I think almost $10 million in uh, public research funds. And uh, the main, the PI behind the grants, the, these grants uh, ended up getting like a, an H index score of, I think it's 35, which is, you know, you're at the, almost the, the, the climax of your scientific career. You know, you're, you know, basically should be in the Academy of Sciences, you know, definitely tenured, uh, should be recognized. And it's it's crazy because it turned out that the work that the um, the data that was was used to kind of prove these symptoms uh, that others were developing drugs based on this were falsified, right? So the images were literally copy pasted from other experiments, and this went on from you know 2006 to 2022, right? That's a long time where people were having issues replicating these results, but it didn't matter because everyone kind of joined in the bandwagon. They were like, oh, all right, AB56, this is the way forward. You had companies that were developing um, uh, therapeutics for this and testing them in humans based on data that you know, wasn't real. It's incredibly dangerous. And so when you just kind of think about how these metrics have been used and how they kind of self-reinforce uh, the system that didn't really work for, the impact really wasn't the kind of impact that we wanted to see. 
So something I've been kind of gravitating more towards, and I would love to hear in the time that we have remaining, is thinking about metrics as kind of something that's a society of expert professional practitioners decide how they want to be evaluated by, right? So I think different metrics might apply for different scenarios, and maybe they change over time. But I think switching the, you know, turning this kind of question on its head and moving away from auditors or third parties giving metrics on people, people as groups deciding collectively what best judges them and the outcomes that they're seeking to, 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 to uh, achieve. And then allowing the funders to make up their own minds, trusting that this expert community knows what it's talking about, because since they're reviewing the grants anyway, right? Thank you, Shadi. I absolutely love that idea. I've written it down. <laughs> Amazing. Um, so we actually only have two minutes left. Um, I think maybe a good thing to close with is if each of you um, gives like a little 30 seconds on maybe like what excites you most about DSI at the moment. And then we'll all um, thank you very much for being here and, and goodbye after that. So uh, I don't know who wants to go first. I know I'm putting you on the spot there. Uh, maybe you can decide between you who wants to go first. Yeah, I can I can go first. I think it's pretty easy for me. What excites me currently about DeFi is the amount of conversation it has started and the way with which it science has only become an interest for people who aren't in science and aren't from science. And I think that's going to be a major movement if we can keep that going. Thank you, Carla. That was amazing. OK, Patrick, you just went to unmute yourself so you can go next. Yeah, so to me, I think like the most exciting thing in science in the last like 20 years is the open science movement. And like if you look at the chart of like open access publications, like it's exponentially growing. And I think that DSI is like an amazing complement to this because people who like partake in open science right now, they kind of do it at like personal risk, like risk at their own career. You know, they're thinking about the world rather than like their own professional or professional incentives. And DSI can like tip the scales where maybe you can make more money and have more career stability by sharing stuff in the open all the time. And so making it make like fiscal sense for scientists to partake in these healthy research behaviors, I think like uh, DSI has a lot of potential there. So that's what I'm very excited about. Thank you, Patrick. That was beautiful. Okay, Shadi, over to you. Yeah, plus, plus 100 to what Patrick just said. Um, yeah, so for me, I think the most exciting thing about DSI is that scientists are talking to each other finally we're building culture outside of the basement laboratories where we like live and <laughs> spend all of our time uh, and i think you know this is incredibly important and has the the middlemen in, in the scientific knowledge curation process absolutely terrified that for the very first time they've been going around talking to scientists for them and facilitating that and now these scientists are talking to each other and i think if we have a society where uh, the free flow of information and knowledge and discourse, critical discourse is just more predominant, more every day, then I think we'll have uh, some amazing outcomes in the future for our society. Thank you very much. That was amazing. Uh, amazing. I just put you on the spot and you just all came up with the goods. Uh, personally, I'm most excited about all you amazing people on the call right here, right now, talking about this stuff, because I think based on our conversation right at the start, things can hopefully only get better. So thank you all for being here. Um, and yeah, um, Carrie, you can carry on the chat in the DSI Guild channel. Thank you so much, Andy, for letting us uh, do this. And thank you to the guests. And yeah, by all means, drop by next week as well. So bye, guys. See ya. Bye now. <laughs>